In 1918, the city of Santa Barbara was smaller in size than it is today. For example, the Mesa was not part of the city yet, and there were fewer people here. The population was about 25,000. The flu hit here in October 1918 and pretty much ended in February 1919. There are not too many figures on the number of cases or deaths in Santa Barbara, but according to an article by Dr. Sai Kinsell, in the fall of 1918, 625 people in Santa Barbara contracted the flu and there were 19 deaths. In addition to government censorship during the war, 100 years ago, Santa Barbara was marketing itself as a healthy place. So I suspect that flu stories were downplayed for that reason. This building is the post office. It's now the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. Now for some general information about the Spanish flu or the so-called Spanish flu. It did not originate in Spain. Recent research suggests that it started in the American Midwest and young men who were drafted carried it with them around the US and Europe. It was called the Spanish flu because newspapers in the US and most countries in Europe were censored and therefore whitewashed stories about the flu to keep up morale. Spain was neutral, however, so its newspapers were not censored and contained more reports of the flu. And that's how the name came about. Worldwide, some 500 million people contracted the flu, about one third of the world's population. The death toll may have been as high as 100 million. That is, 20% of the people who got the flu died from it. More people died from the flu than from World War I. In addition to the high death rate, most of the fatalities occurred in people who were in their 20s and 30s. So let's get started with August 1918. The war in Europe was far away geographically, but news about the war dominated the front pages of the Santa Barbara papers. Although the news was censored and generally upbeat, there was no avoiding the reports that brought sadness to everyone who knew someone in the war. This month, the news of the first death of the first young man from Santa Barbara cast a pall over the local press. The mayor asked that flags be flown at half mast. In addition, the bells at the mission in Our Lady of Sorrows told 24 times to count out the years of the young man's life. Our Lady of Sorrows Catholic Church was located at the northeast corner of Figueroa and State Streets. Way back when, a slacker was what we would call a draft dodger. Men who were of draft age but were exempted were expected to work at a useful job. As of July 1, 1918, a new law nicknamed work or fight took effect. The local paper wrote, the little group of idle cavaliers who used to gather late in the afternoons and attach themselves to the scenery have seemingly utterly vanished from the spotlight of public esteem. Now, although Santa Barbara's shoreline is very photogenic, photo buffs were told to refrain from using their cameras to capture images of the coastline. The reason? Concern about espionage. The paper announced, Sunday excursionists who have been in the habit of cruising about the bay accompanied with a camera have been warned by Uncle Sam that they will not be permitted to take photographs. There was still some normal news. For example, Santa Barbara was quickly becoming known as an art center. Swedish American artist Carl Oscar Borg was settling in his home on the Mesa. And the Astra Film Co Company was using the Gillespie Estate in Montecito as the setting for a movie named Our Better Selves. It was described as the perfect site for a movie that dealt with the story of a social butterfly 
who used her old vain and frivolous self as a stepping stone to better things. We didn't seem to have any influenza cases here in Santa Barbara yet, but the healthcare professionals knew it would hit us eventually. The best defense was to wear a mask if you were sick or if you wanted to avoid becoming sick. A local doctor gave a talk at the Rotary Club meeting this month and advised sick people to wear masks. September, 1918. At Santa Barbara High School, the football team was put on the bench. So many boys from the football team had volunteered or been drafted that the team was disbanded for the 1918-1919 school year. And because the United States was struggling to feed its fighting men and helping to supply food for the war-torn countries in Europe, food prices were heading skyward. And as food began to be worth more, it became more attractive to thieves. Now, believe it or not, this type of lady swimsuit caused complaints because it covered less of the feminine physique than older suits, older suits. The paper reported, a number of girls, it is said, have been called off the beach and reminded by the police officers that their bathing suits are too scanty. Another woman that was causing headlines here was the first female taxi driver in Santa Barbara. She was able to change tires and fix breakdowns herself. Both were frequent occurrences in cars at this time. There didn't seem to be any influenza cases in Santa Barbara yet, but it was only a matter of time before that dreaded disease arrived here. The local paper wrote, reading of the ravages of the malady in Europe, we Americans confidently hoped that it would not cross the Atlantic. October, 1918. Everything changed on October 14. There were more than 50 articles in the local papers this month about the flu. Up until October 13, the paper announced that while some people here had colds or mild flu symptoms, these were not considered to be the deadly type of disease. Flu invades Santa Barbara. Schools, movies, other public gathering places may close. 50 cases, five serious ones already reported in city. Meetings were canceled or postponed and the schools and churches closed. Flu remedies were popular in newspaper articles and advertisements. Lemons bound upward as flu remedy was one headline in the local paper. Santa Barbara's Johnston Fruit Company reported that demands for lemons were coming in from all over the country. The Veronica Medicinal Springs Water Company jumped into the action with a full page ad that recommended both internal and external use of its healing waters as a flu treatment and preventative. Some people just stayed home. Many of those who went out wore masks or scarves. Doctors, nurses, other healthcare workers, and anyone with the cold or flu were required to wear masks. Barbers, dentists, and pharmacists were advised to wear masks. The local Red Cross jumped into action and made 1,400 masks. Some people made their own. Everyone who traveled in a vehicle had to wear a gauze mask. Wear your mask or cops will get you. Many masks were made of several layers of gauze or cheesecloth. Some sources recommended a few drops of bichloride of mercury or kerosene be added to the gauze. Please note, I do not recommend this. 
the influenza scare was alarming the parents of trick-or-treaters and put a damper on the demons on the streets of Santa Barbara. Although it was not stated in the local papers, I'm guessing that there was also enough news about deaths from disease and the war that folks lost their joy in celebrating the macabre. Flu puts quietus on revelry in celebration of Halloween. The Board of Health has issued orders forbidding ghosts to walk or congregate on Halloween this year. In past years, Halloween, the night on which ghosts are both unusually active and unusually propitious, has been celebrated in many and various ways by small boys and older ones too, who on mischief bent prowl the streets until a late hour and older folks who made the night merry with dancing and parties. But on Halloween this year, there will be none of the usual gaiety for all are united in the effort to check the spread of the dread disease. And remember, we were still at war. The paper announced high school boys to hurl rocks in mimic warfare. The boys at Santa Barbara High School who were part of the Cadet Corps were receiving quasi-military training in drills for practicing grenade throwing. November, 1918. <clears throat> in just 10 days, the families of 10 young men in Santa Barbara County received telegrams from the War Department that began, we regret to inform you of the death of your son. And finally, on November 11, armistice was declared and the bells of Santa Barbara rang out. The war was over at last, but the dreaded telegrams continued coming for months as the final count of casualties continued. November 6, <clears throat> grip victims increase in number. November 8, flu epidemic unabated report. November 24, La Grip still holds city closed. November 27, grip malady proves plague. November 29, epidemic gives orphanage hard hit. Although folks here were thankful that the great war had ended, the Thanksgiving festivities were somewhat subdued because of the influenza ban puts a quietus on all gatherings and this applies rigidly to church. As a result, the usual Thanksgiving service, such an epical event in the past, will be lacking. This year in Santa Barbara, there will be no means of holding the usual organized observance of the day, starting with church services extraordinary and ending with the festive family parties. The only Thanksgiving church service that was held in the area was in Montecito. Churches had been ordered closed, but outdoor assemblies were apparently allowed. So one church in Montecito held an open air service. The congregation assembled in front of All Saints Church with the doors of the church open so that the music of the organ could reach the singers without. December, 1918. At the beginning of December, the quarantine was lifted. The paper wrote, the sidewalks were crowded with a merry throng. Practically every individual that hurried hither and thon, hither and yon, was loaded with Christmas cheer of some sort. Children as well as grown-ups mingled with the crowd, returned sailors and soldiers were everywhere. January, 1919. The flu was back, or maybe it never left. Holiday crowds get blame for increase in influenza cases, according to the headline in the local paper. The article stated that there had been 50 new cases reported the day before, which brought the total up 
to 191 in the last four days. It was believed that the increase in illnesses had been due to people congregating for Christmas activities. The flu was called a crowd disease. The schools were closed, the churches were closed, the theaters were closed, the library was closed, and also the billiard and pool halls and bowling alleys. In short, all public gathering places were closed. Long distance learning. Schools had been closed for weeks in the fall and when the Spanish flu first hit Santa Barbara. In early January, schools were closed again when the number of flu cases resurged. This time, the schools were prepared. Install correspondence system in high school. Principal issues instructions to students. Headlined a long article that described the new system. The Santa Barbara Red Cross was calling for any volunteers who had attended home nursing courses. It is necessary at present to care for many small children whose parents are removed to hospitals. Girls and small children were being housed at St. Vincent's on De La Vina Street, and boys were staying at another institution. The flu even reached Santa Cruz Island, and many of the men there were sick. February, 1919. In my book, I wrote, we can only imagine what the five week Spanish flu quarantine must have been like. Let me take a drink here. Schools were closed, churches were closed, theaters were closed, clubs were closed, pool rooms were closed, and the library was closed. Well, now we know about that firsthand. But somehow the good people of Santa Barbara back then managed to cope. Students could mail their assignments to their teachers. Ministers' sermons were printed in the local paper. And, local, and the local record store delivered records to people on approval so that the records could be returned the next day. People could call friends and relatives on the phone and newspapers were delivered, but of course there was no radio or television or internet. And finally, it was over. During five weeks, not a projecting machine in the four motion picture houses clicked once. Not an urchin with the necessary dime clutched in his right hand got so far as the main entrance. Dances, meetings, lodge gatherings, socials, and banquets can now be held without fear. Shake out your old dress suit from where it has been lying among the mothballs and count your accumulated change for a trip to the movies. The ban is lifted. Four short words, but fraught with much meaning and promise. And a great thanksgiving that the epidemic has passed. No longer will State Street look like the aftermath of a Quaker meeting. And so the pandemic petered out. There was another wave of the flu in the fall of 1919, but it was a less severe form. Viruses change over time. Once the flu was behind us, not many people wanted to look back. There were few articles about it. Books about the flu did not appear for many years. People wanted to move on. People wanted to remember the good times for those years. And there were some good times, and we did have some good memories. I hope you enjoyed this trip back to the past in Santa Barbara. I would encourage you to visit the Historical Museum's website where you can share some of your present quarantine experiences, good or bad, for future generations.